Welcome to episode seven of the Indie Film Academy podcast. Today, we're talking with filmmaker Kevin Shahinian. So as always, hold on to your butts. Here we go. Welcome to the Indie Film Academy podcast, where it's all about learning how to make and market your independent film online. And now your host, Jason Buff. Hey guys, welcome to the Indie Film Academy podcast. I am your host, Jason Buff. Uh, today, we're going to be talking with filmmaker Kevin Shahinian of Pacific Pictures. Now, I first became aware of Kevin during a presentation he did at the Cine Summit a few weeks ago that absolutely blew me away. Now, Kevin's got a really unique niche or niche, whatever you want to call it. He primarily does really, really super high-end wedding videos. And I'm not talking about these wedding videos that are just guy with a camera following events. I mean, he makes full short films out of what I can only assume are very, very wealthy clients because, I mean, the quality on these things is absolutely amazing. Honestly, go to Pacific Pictures and look at some of his, I mean, he does a lot of short films that are, you know, from clients. And one of the really amazing things about it is, you know, I was watching his film Matroshka, and it stars one of the people that's getting married, and it's actually a full narrative um, short film. So one of the things we talk about is how to get a performance out of somebody who's a non-actor. And I, I think it's amazing to hear how to – a lot of times as filmmakers, when we're working with actors, sometimes they're our friends, sometimes they're actually actors, but – one of the really hard things to do sometimes is to get a believable performance out of people. And we, we talk about that. We talk about lenses, equipment, technical stuff. So anyway, I want to get to that as soon as possible. Don't forget to go to IndieFilmAcademy.com and sign up for our newsletter. And if you like this podcast, please, please leave us a review. It really helps us out. Okay, let me go ahead and get to the interview. And here we go. I was wondering if you could take us through your... Um, career kind of where you started and how things started out and, and where you you know what you learned I know you went to USC and if you could talk for just a little bit about the road that brought you to um, to where you are now yeah of course um, yeah as you mentioned uh, I did go to film school um, I think I knew really early on in my life that I wanted to be a filmmaker I wanted to be involved with you know in, in some way making films um, I was doing it just like, you know, for fun as a kid, um, making little videos with friends and stuff like that. So it's always sort of been something I've done. Um, and after film school, um, I, I really focused, I, I saw myself as a writer, director, a storyteller um, of narrative fiction. I never saw myself as, you know, someone who would go into the documentary side or, you know, trying to do events or anything like that. Um, so I wrote a lot. I wrote a lot of screenplays. Um, while I was interning, I had interned at um, New Line Cinema. I did an internship with um, James Cameron for a summer. Um, and I worked on sets as a PA, um, just really trying to find my road or my path to becoming a writer director. Um, and, you know, needless to say, extremely difficult, um, you know, to break into the Hollywood feature film world. Um, and while I was doing that, I got asked to shoot uh, a couple weddings. These are just, you know, friends' weddings. Um, never really thought much of it. Never really thought to like start it as a business. Just did it. Um, but I wanted to put my spin on it, obviously, as a, as a filmmaker. Um, and so I sort of like convinced a couple friends to go a little bit above and beyond and outside the box with what we did. So we made little short films and lo and behold, they were very popular when we posted them on YouTube. Um, got tens of thousands of views and just really surprised me in how the, res the response was just so, so huge. Um, I actually got, I got asked to, I got interviewed by a magazine. They put me on the cover of their magazine for this short film that I had made for a wedding. And it just sort of like struck me like, wow, you know, this is, this is something, <laughs> you know? So yeah, you're doing something, right? Yeah, so that's kind of how it. That's kind of my path, and sort of how it ended up. You know, I never in a million years thought I'd be doing events or weddings or anything like that. Um, but you know, the sort of the demand was there, and it's just sort of snowballed after the first one. What were you shooting with? Is this before the whole DSLR revolution and all that? Yeah, I mean, I think I shot my first wedding in college, like on a TRV 900. You know, the old mini DV camera. Um, 
And when I, when I turned it into a business, um, we were shooting um, on Canon. We were shooting on, on the XHA1. That's again still, you know, the mini DV days. I think it was HDV at that time. Um, and we would actually take that camera and we would actually use those. I don't know if you remember or recall the 35 millimeter adapters. Oh yeah, like the the lettuce or what is it called? Yeah, yeah, we were using the the Cinevate version, the Brevis. Uh, you know, we'd we'd mount that on the front of the camera. We'd stick those old Canon FD lenses on the adapters, and we'd show up to weddings with these like ginormous rigs. Um, you know, just <laughs> trying to get shallow depth of field out of these three chip mini DV cameras. You know. Um, so when the DSLRs came out, I think it was like 2000, late 2008, early 2009, it was like, wow, you know, we don't need these gigantic things anymore. So. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things I, I remember seeing the movie monsters and I, I know that he shot with an adapter and a 50 millimeter 1.2 and just thinking, you know, it, it just looked like it was shot on film. So I assume that the, the weddings that you were shooting must have looked pretty amazing to people that were accustomed to seeing videos. Yeah, yeah, Gareth Edwards, I think he used the EX-1 and a lettuce, um, awesome movie. Um, yeah, so we were trying to really get, just get that filmic look uh, out, of, out of video, which was really revolutionary at the time. You know, all these, the cliche wedding videos were just everywhere, and, you know, trying to do something really cinematic and really commercial looking was really something new at the time. Now, what were some of the things that, you know, going back to the internships you had and, you know, you said you work with James Cameron, what were some of the key things that you learned during that period about filmmaking that maybe you didn't learn at USC? I learned it was really tough to actually, to actually find time behind the camera and actually be creative. Um, you know, I interned for James Cameron, but I, I, I think I saw him one time. In like the <laughs> four months I was I was there at his office in Santa Monica, um, I never it was it was just really tough. I mean, the New Line Cinema internship was awesome. Like it was the production office. They took us to set um, as much as they possibly could. That was a lot of fun. Um, I got to see um, several of the movies they were in, that were in production at the time. I got to just watch the the crew dynamic, the way the directors were working with these huge stars. Um, I, we went down to downtown LA. They were shooting a scene for John Q with Denzel Washington. Um, I, and I hope I'm not getting it wrong. I believe Nick Cassavetes directed that. And I was watching them. Um, there was like 75 extras and just watching, you know, take after take and how they would work, um, in the, with these large crews was, was fascinating. But personally, like myself being a creative person, I saw that it was going to be a long, hard road getting to be creative, like eventually getting to the creative place. Um, and I kind of felt that the only way to continue writing and directing was to write and direct, not to hope that somebody would give me a chance to write and direct, but to actually just go do it. Uh, and so, you know, you only get better by, by continuing to hone your craft and practice your art. So I just, I found time and I found ways to continue writing and, con and to continue to make films. I, I, and I've, and as, mu as, as good as I thought I was, like, you know, out of film school, I'm like, wow, I went to film school. I'm, I, I have all I need. I have all the schools and skills and tools I need to direct. I was so wrong, you know, and, and learning as each film that I made, I learned, you know, how much more practice I needed um, and how much how vast the art of filmmaking really is and how many possibilities there are and how like, I don't think anybody could ever master it. It's so complex, you know? So well, what are, what are some of the biggest challenges you've had and things that you've developed over the years, things that you, you continue to get better at? Well, I think, um, I think, you know, not, you know, complacency is really an easy thing. I mean, filmmaking is really difficult, like both physically and mentally when you're on set and you're shooting, um, and just, you know, doing like two or three takes and you're saying, okay, like that's good enough. Let's move on. Uh, you know, not having that attitude, um, doing something till it's doing something till it's, it's, it's to, to, a to the standard or to the vision that you had before you started. Um, that's, that's one thing I, I I've always sort of like tried to push and, and I, I deal with a lot of non-actors. Um, so like expecting 
a level of performance from them um, that we, you would normally not get from a non-actor, you know, like rehearsing a lot, um, making sure they understand the material, making sure they're able to hit those like emotional beats of the scene or whatever they're trying to convey. Um, you know, and, and um, there's just so much. I mean, like in, in some of the projects that I've done, I've had to wear a lot of hats. Um, right. I've had to do, I've had to do camera. I've had to do audio. I've had to do, um, you know, just like all the post-production work sometimes. Um, and doing that, it really helps you learn. Like it really helps you understand the challenges that, you know, sound designers face, that editors face. Um, and as a director, even if you want to be an editor, even if you want to be a production designer, it doesn't matter, you know, doing all the jobs really helps you understand how the pieces fit together in a film. Now you mentioned working with non-actors, are there any tips that you can give for, you know, a lot of a lot of the people that listen to this are people that are making their first film, they don't really have any budget at all, they're trying to, you know, maybe even put their friends into, you know, into acting roles and things like that. Are there any ways that you can really um, take people that are non-actors or even people that are, I don't know, bad actors <laughs> and actually like pull off a pretty good performance from them? I think so. I, I definitely think so. I mean, all the work that I do um, is I'm actually pulling financing, or I guess I'm pulling the budget from the talent themselves. The talent in, in my business, the talent is hiring me to create films, and they've never acted before, but they want the experience of being in a movie. Um, uh, you know, so at least on that and from that from that point of view, they're willing um, and they're interested. Um, I would say for, as far as tips, um, you know, rehearsing, I found rehearsing to be an enormous uh, benefit. Um, you know, reading through the material, talking to um, your talent and like asking them, it really like sort of like a method approach where you um, ask them, you know, how, how, can you remember a time in your life when you felt this way? Um, you know, describe that moment for me. Um, you know, can you take yourself there when we're, when you're in front of the camera performing this, this particular scene? Um, and I think that, you know, once they get the material down, they've memorized it so well, they don't have to focus on the actual words. They can take themselves to that moment and, you know, convey that emotion. Do you ever run into a situation where they're like really trying to act and you're just like, okay, you know, take it down a notch or whatever, you know, they, they're trying to be like the next, uh, Robert De Niro yeah, definitely. I mean, overacting is, <laughs> overacting is like the other side of it. <laughs> and I, what I try to, you know, I don't think you'd ever do this for a professional, although like I think David O. Russell has been said that he like yells at his actors off camera. Um, when, I'm, when I'm dealing with a non-actress, I will sometimes, whether it's unprofessional or not, like I will like call out direction, like while the camera's rolling. Um, and that helps that sometimes, you know, I'll just be like, Hey, you know, like, like look down or like, you know, do that, do that one line again, or look this way or whatever. Um, I also have another little trick, um, where I actually roll the camera and I don't say action right away. Right. Um, I actually look like I'll pretend like I'm doing something and for like 20, 30 seconds. And then I'll, I'll say, okay, ready, ready. Okay. Action. Um, and then at the end of the scene, I won't say cut. I'll just leave it. I'll just let it, let it linger. Uh, for another 30 seconds and it's those in between moments for the non-actors those moments actually are extremely authentic and they're they're not self-aware at all you can almost see it click when you say action they like their whole body language changes and they're like they stiffen up and it's like oh, okay now i'm on camera so when they don't realize they're on camera they're not as self-conscious and it's sometimes some of the best acting they do um and those are just little looks and little like cutaways you can use. Um, actually, a lot of those end up in the in the final product for me. Okay. Now, um, what? This is kind of a broad question, but can you talk about what goes into like what what is the main preparation that you have to do before you start shooting a scene? That might be a little too broad. <laughs> Um, are you, do you say, you mean like the day of or like, in yeah, the day of, I, I wanted to, to get more into the, the, 
the bones of actually putting together a shoot, you know, what, or, or maybe it would be better to talk about what goes into a project. Like how does a, when a, when a client comes to you, how do, how does the process develop and how do you create a screenplay? Do you create a, a script of what's going to go on? How do you deal with, I mean, especially if you're working with a very minimal crew, how do you, um, do locations? How do you figure out lighting? It's a very vague kind of answer, but I, I was kind of getting hoping to get kind of an overview of how you how do you work. Yeah, uh, of course. Well, so uh, first step, I'll get contacted. Um, someone's interested. Um, basically, my questions become: What is your budget? Um, what are you looking to to create? Um, and from there, I sort of I'm off and running. Um, I think budget is the number one. I need to understand like what the budget is. I mean, if it's it's a small budget that you know that determines script that determines locations that determines what we can do um if it's, a, if it's a decent budget then i sort of have more freedom and i know that's not a very good like you don't want to always write with budget in mind however um in this particular in my particular case um, i almost have to um and a, and a producer once told me um don't worry about how we're going to execute what you write, write with, with nothing in mind, but your creative vision. And we'll worry about how we're going to execute that later. And if we have to compromise, we will, um, and, you know, that's, that's kind of good advice for a writer. Um, but not a good, not great advice for a writer, director, producer, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> right. Um, so, you know, we are always going to be limited. It doesn't matter who you are. Even the big budget Hollywood guys have limitations. Um, so understanding those is step one. You know, from there, I, I talk to the client. I try to understand what their goals are um, and always sort of distill things down to one very simple basic idea um, or a theme, if you will. Um, we do two types of films. We do the standalone scripted narrative, and then we also do um, like documentary with some fiction narrative intermixed in there. Um, we do more of those than we do the scripted narrative. This just a you know traditional short film. Right. Um, for me, that the, the short film is easier. It's my comfort zone. It's like what I what I do best. Um, and I think when a client hires me to do those, they have a little more. They give me a little more leeway. They give me a little bit more freedom in terms of the content. Um, when they're asking me to document an event that they are producing. Um, there's a little bit more of an agenda on their end on how they want the final product to look. Um, so when it comes to, you know, producing, um, I, I, first of all, I will try to try to pick, like determine a length. Like we're going to make a 10 minute film. We're going to make an eight minute film. We're going to make a 20 minute film, um, um, you know, based on uh, budget. And then from there sort of, a lot of times the, the locations are actually determined by where the event is taking place. Um, we do a lot of overseas shoots. Well, for the, for the sake of doing, um, if we can focus for, for primarily on the, uh, the ones that are creating a narrative and doing more of like a dramatic short, um, just for the sake of time, because I, I want to focus on that a little bit because there's a lot of, I think there's a lot that filmmakers can take from that, you know, your, your approach to screenwriting, your approach to camera movement and, you know, that sort of thing. So, uh, would it be okay if we focus on that first? Yeah, of course. Of okay. Course. Um, yeah. So, uh, for me, location, I mean, location is a, is a character almost. I, I love sort of bringing, bringing different locations in as, as sort of like, characters themselves um I, i've done a lot of scripted narratives um in like very exotic foreign destinations um, i've actually done a lot of scripted narratives in foreign languages um one of my first was one that we did in sweden and the whole thing was in swedish um, i will write in english um, usually the clients or the actors speak both languages and they end up translating everything um, so when it comes to when it comes to really like writing the script and, and deciding what the story is going to be, it's really like, like, like I said, a very simple idea based on, usually it's based on a true story in my case. Um, and you know, some of my favorite movies of the last 10 years are based on true stories like Zero Dark Thirty, Captain Phillips, we just had American Sniper. Like all of these movies are amazing and they're all based on true stories. Um, 
And it has actually a, have been a big lesson for me um, is authenticity lost in creativity. Like, can we celebrate a historical fact and be extremely creative in its depiction and even bring more authenticity to that historical moment? Um, so in terms of... Um, in terms of approach, it's been challenging because, I, like I said, it's a lot of exotic destinations. I'll have to do a lot of producing, um, location scouting, um, things of that nature remotely. I'll actually have to do them like online. I'll have to have um, a lot of times clients' family will live um, locally and they'll send me photos. Um, we'll just have, you know, we'll have to determine all that stuff. I'll usually plan like a two or three day um, of pre-production when we arrive before we start shooting so that I can finalize the locations. A lot of times I'll end up auditioning actors over Skype um, and then you know meeting them in person, picking like the, the, the top two for a given role and then meeting them and talking to them and then deciding once we're there, almost like a couple of days before we start shooting. Um, you know, so it's a, it's, a, it's a lot of guerrilla style, run and gun, um, lots of like on location. I don't build any sets. Right. Um, most of this, of the lighting is natural light, um, shooting a lot of live events. I've learned very quickly how to exploit natural light, how to, um, stage a scene with the windows in a room to make it look as cinematic as possible without adding a whole ton of lighting. Um, the DSLRs have been huge in, you know, allowing, allowing natural light settings to look more cinematic. I remember in the, in the old adapter days, having to bring in a couple of kinos and a couple, you know, like 650s and 1,000 watts for even small rooms um, just to make them look, make them look decent. Um, so not a whole ton of added lighting. Um, sometimes we will, some, most of the time not. Uh, camera movement and, and, you know, in coverage, um, that's really like an artistic choice. Uh, there's no right or wrong really, you know, like I just, I, I've just studied Hollywood movies. I've watched so many movies. Um, I, I try to watch movies several times and like in subsequent viewings, I'll, I'll turn off the soundtrack. I'll just watch the visuals. Um, I think that's a good way to kind of like learn and understand, um, how you're responding to a given scene in a, in a film. Do you have any favorites in particular you can mention? Yeah. I mean, I love, um, I love watching Scorsese films with the sound off. Oh yeah. Uh, his, I mean, his, like, you know, he, there's so many cam, like whip pans and like fluid masters and just crazy stuff that you don't necessarily pick up on when you're immersed in the story. And that's a good thing. Um, I think the, you know, the greatest directors understand that they can do crazy camera moves anytime they want, but actually don't do them and dial themselves back because they know it would be distracting. Right. You know, to me, that's, that's, that's talent, you know, like, um, Chris Nolan, uh, Sam Mendes is another, you know, Sam, like watching like American beauty road to perdition. He's a theater director. So his compositions and, and how he worked with Conrad Hall is stunning and lots of just locked off camera. Um, and, and just the way he composed his frames was really a lesson for me. And, um, I love watching, you know, Sam Mendy's films with the, with the soundtrack off. Um, and like I said, you know, Chris Nolan, he, he's very, he's a very reserved in terms of camera movement. Um, you know, and on the other side of that, there's Alfonso Cuaron who does 20 minute takes, you know, there's like the opening shot of gravity was, I think it was like 16, 17 minutes. Um, but he does them in such a way where they're not calling attention to themselves and it serves the story. So I think like what I try to ask myself is when I'm placing the camera and if I'm deciding whether to move it or not, is, is this serving the story? And am I as a director getting in the way of the story? Am I going to distract my audience with how I'm shooting this? Right. Now, if we can focus for one second, actually, I could spend all day talking about camera movement, but I, I want to try and get get to a couple of topics here. Um, you, you were talking about lighting, and one of the things that's really striking about all your videos is how beautiful the lighting is on everything. And um, I just wanted to, to discuss that for a little bit. For example, I was watching Matroshka, and there's a scene where there's a lot of scenes that take place in the airport at the beginning and then in the cab and a lot of it's shot outside. Now, in that situation, are you just what, what would happen, for example, if the there was like a bright sunlight? 
during, you know, if, if the sun was coming down, if the light during the day was ugly, would you just like pick another day to shoot or would you like try to figure out some way to, to work around it? Or, or how do you work when, when the light outside isn't that nice? Do you just try to find the right times of day? Yeah, definitely. Uh, we lucked out big time in Moscow. It was o overcast almost the entire time we were there. Uh, so that wasn't as big of a problem. Um, I, I definitely planned the exteriors um, at, at particular times of day, knowing that we'd have much softer light in the morning and the late afternoon. Um, and just, you know, just lucking out with um, really overcast weather. I mean, there's a, there was a ton of takes, just especially in the cab. Um, there's, two, there's two scenes in, in the car um, where there's just a ton of takes where the sun would just come blasting through. Um, you know, spending like you know having to call cut or just you know hold hold for light and then you know we're mo we're moving in a real car. That's another thing you know like understanding why they do so much green screen rear projection. Um, shooting in an actual moving car is extremely challenging, especially for continuity when you're cutting um, between the two passengers and and maintaining whatever the ba the background is. If if there's an awesome take from five minutes later, you know, in the background, it's radically changed. Um, so having to maintain continuity with lighting, um, and just, you know, waiting, waiting for the right, um, waiting for the right conditions when you're shooting outside, that's just, it's just kind of like the name of the game. So would you say that's kind of the most important aspect of, of cinematography with that kind of budget is just trying to find natural light that can work and, and almost looks like it was, I mean, because if th that was a film production, they'd have you know, like a scrim on top of the car. They'd have all kinds of lights and stuff. And I imagine you were just sitting in the front seat with your camera shooting that, and it looks amazing. Yeah, totally. It's just totally just me. Um, just, yeah, you, you're right. There would be lights mounted all around the exterior of the car. There would be the car would be you know attached. It would be being towed by a by a picture driver, and the 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 actor is not even <laughs> the one driving. You know what I mean? <laughs> There'd be another driver somewhere right. on a on a real truck that's just towing on a flatbed. Um, I mean, you know, it's funny. I've, I've done it all. I mean, we did a film where I actually had a major portion of the script. It was a police chase at night. Um, and, the and you know, it was a motorcycle being chased by three cop cars. Um, and it required a process trailer where, like I said, the, the motorcycle is um, attached to a flatbed truck. The, the actor's not actually driving the vehicle. Someone else is driving the flatbed truck. Um, it required uh, stunt drivers, all all kinds of stuff, and really it came down to the fact that that client had a much bigger budget, so we could do all those things. And for me in Russia, um, time was money. I mean, I couldn't do, I couldn't light, I couldn't pull a permit, shut a street down, attach all these lights to the exterior of the car, and like do all that just for the fact that we didn't have enough time, we didn't have enough money, um, and just you know understanding that when I was writing the script, not writing a police chase for a Russian film, but just writing a, you know, much more conservative two-way conversation in a car um, and, and doing a lot of tests with camera mounts inside a very similar, similarly configured car um, here locally, just doing camera tests with um, stand-ins to understand if I needed to use any light modifiers, um, you know, would just having natural light bouncing around in the car be sufficient um, how much camera shake we'd get. Um, we use a, we did use a lot of car mounts, uh, on the interiors. Uh, and I was concerned, you know, would it, would it be, would there be a lot of vibration? Um, and just, you know, doing different tests to mitigate that and be fully prepared when we got there to not, you know, take extra days or time reshooting things. That was for the Matroshka shoot? Yeah. That was for the shoot in Russia. You're talking about? Yeah. Can you, can you talk about kind of, um, some of the gear that you absolutely find essential in a shoot like that when you're out on your own and you don't have a big crew with you, or even if you do have a couple of people with you, what, what do you find to be the most important things in terms of maybe light modifiers and, and even your, your uh, camera kit? Well, I have, um, uh, for that film, we shot on the Canon 5Ds, uh, the DSLRs. For me, it kind of like number one is is great glass um, lenses. To me, are the one thing I, I don't mind investing in. Um, we had a bunch of L series lenses. Um, the zooms for me were were key. Um, I know a lot of people prefer primes. I particularly don't 
I don't like shooting so wide open for, for my films. I, I don't like that ultra, ultra shallow depth of field look. I don't mind the zooms at 2.8. Um, so I had the zooms with me. Um, for me, like the number one thing, and I know this doesn't sound like too sexy, but a tripod. I mean, honestly, <laughs> like a really amazing fluid head and a really high quality tripod is my... Like, I can't leave home without that. Um, and I know it doesn't sound that like, you know, it's like what well, you don't have a steady cam or whatever. Like, no, I, I want to have at least two or three amazing tripods with the best fluid heads I can find. Um, that's my number one after lenses. Um, great sound. I, I did a lot of, um, I do a lot of wired labs. Um, mm-hmm. And there's no, you know, there's no nothing wrong with wireless. Um, if you have a great sound person who can, you know, be monitoring that at all times, I don't have the luxury of being able to like focus my sole attention on the audio at all times. So I usually do, um, I'll do two wired, uh, two units with labs that are both wired. So meaning like um, little pocket recorders with really nice labs, um, and then you know hiding those mics on the talent and having them kind of set to like one at, you know, one at a certain level, one at another at an auto level in case there's a clip or whatever a problem. So I have a backup. Um, and, you know, doing my... Do you monitor that while you're shooting? No, I can't because it's wired and the talent is usually... You know, in the car I did, um, in the car scenes I could because were, we were so close to each other. Um, in the airport scene, um, could not because they were, they were like, you know, 50, 75 feet away from me. In the little talking heads um, kitchen scene, I could. So it depends. Like, if they're, if they're further away, obviously you can't do it. If they're next to you, you can do it. Um, that's the one advantage of, of wireless. Um, and I will often actually mic mic them up with wireless labs if I know they're going to be farther away from me just to kind of hear what they're saying. Um, just as sort of an eavesdrop as a director. Um, but you know, just investing in, in, in amazing mics, investing in good glass and investing in an awesome tripod, I'd say like my top three, top three things. Now, let me just ask you one more question about the audio. Uh, cause that it's intriguing for me to, to, to think about, um, leaving the, the actual recorder with the talent. Now, do you, how do you manage, do you just set the volume really low for that? Or do you, do you just risk blowing out the, the volume or, or how do you, how do you set that up? So I, so yeah. So, I mean, obviously having a sound person is vastly preferred. I mean, like a million to one, <laughs> right? Obviously if I was uh-huh. to, if I was to hire one person, just one person after myself as director DP and wearing all those other hats, it would be a sound it would be onset sound recordist, uh, boom operator. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of times it's that I don't have that luxury of being able to be as um, uh, conspicuous. You know, if I'm shooting on location and I don't have a permit and I'm trying to pull like the news gathering card, I can't have a boom guy there. Um, you know, so I actually will go. I actually put a lot of faith in auto levels. Um, I have some really high quality recorders where the auto level is actually pretty good. Um, I'll have the actor, you know, go through a, a sound test and try to, with the other one, I will try to set an ideal level. Um, so I'll have one that I, I feel is not going to clip and I feel is a, is a perfect level. And then I have another one that's just at auto level in case there's some improv or some, whatever other thing happens to be louder for that particular, for that particular scene. Um, uh, but it's worked out. I mean, it's worked out. I, I would say more often than not. I would get interference on the wireless than I would a clipping or a level issue with the wired. Right. And do you get the, your your actors to like slate for you by clapping or anything, or how do you click uh, sync it up later? I use a piece of software called Pluralize. Ah, okay, okay, right. Yeah, so I mean, I have very bad habits on set. I don't do any slating. I know it's, it's <laughs> terrible, and you should absolutely slate everything, but I don't. Right. Now, for for people who don't have that much of a budget, are there any workarounds? Is it just absolutely essential? Could you possibly do something that's at this quality with slightly cheaper equipment, or is it just not going to come close? Uh, No, I think you could. I definitely think you could. Um, Really, it's all about the content. I think once you... Like like that producer once told me, don't worry about... um, how you're going to execute it. Just write with reckless abandon, write with as much creativity as possible and worry about how you're going to execute it later. 
Um, I think you can do the exact opposite sometimes. I think you can see what limitations you have and you can write with those limitations in mind, trying to exploit them and make it seem as though you had no limitations, right? So if you only have, um, you know, your, your two buddies as your actors and you have access to, you know, you know, your apartment and, you know, you have a couple props, how can you exploit those assets and write a script around it to make it seem like, you found those two guys, you found that apartment and you found those things, you know, make it seem like you had no limitations. Um, right. I, I don't think equipment, I mean, to a certain degree, equipment is important, obviously. Um, but once, once you're, when you're watching a film and once you're engaged in that bit of content, I think maybe within the first five or 10 seconds, you know, is this going to be a great, great thing, especially in this internet age when you're watching everything on the internet and our attention spans are so short. Um, if I'm engaged in a film, I forget, I don't care about what camera they shot on after the first 10 seconds. So, right. I mean, I think, I think it's possible. I think you just have to understand the limitations of each, of each piece of equipment. I mean, personally shooting on the DSLRs, they have a ton of limitations. Like it's not the best camera by any means. Um, you know, there's a, there's a ton of better, better pieces of kit out there. Um, they're, they're, you know, obviously way more expensive, but understanding the limitations of the camera that you're using and only putting yourself in situations where the camera strengths shine, you know? Well, talking about that, you use mainly the 50D Mark III, right? And also the C100. Yeah, the five, the 5D and the C100. Yep. What, what's the main, the C100 is purely for, for, you know, cinematic shooting. So, I mean, is there a huge difference between shooting with those two? So the C100, in, in the, in the case of the Russian film, it was maybe three or four shots with the C100. I'd say 95% of the location stuff in Russia was 5D. Mm -hmm. Um, C100 is, is great for, um, it, it gives you all the ergonomics of the traditional video cameras before the DSLRs came out, you know, all the things that videographers wanted, um, just in terms of form factor, uh, and different features, um, on the camera. Um, uh, of course, quality is, is, is improved. Um, but for being a one, you know, guy who's wearing all the hats and, and running shoots where there's three and four different cameras on a location in a moving car, for me, like the 5D, I, I couldn't see myself using any other camera than the 5D. Uh, I couldn't take the car apart and, and shoot with a process trailer. I had to stick the 5D bodies in the nooks and crannies of the car. Um, right. So this was actually, you know, a huge benefit having a tiny, very small form factor camera. Um, and, you know, they... Are you using magic lantern or are you shooting raw with that or is it just the regular files? No, I, I've experimented with um, magic lantern and raw. Um, the file sizes for for a five and a half six day shoot for me I didn't want such gigantic files um, I didn't feel the need to shoot raw I mean I was concerned with dynamic range in, in a lot of the internal the uh, interiors of the car um, whether or not I'd have like really blown highlights and you know how 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 much dynamic range I'd be able to get out of those shots um, but it ended up ended up working out I did a lot of tests actually in raw. Um, and found that it was just it was just not necessary for me on that on that film. And what in terms of so I'm I'm going to go a little technical for a second if you don't mind. Um, when you're shooting, what what uh, are you shooting at the same aspect ratio that your the final product is in? Because there, what is the the aspect ratio that you typically shoot in, uh, or that that your the, the video files are in? So I'm actually shooting in um, whatever the native 5D is. It's just 16 by 9, uh, you know, roughly 185 to 1, um, right. more of a square. square. You know, So it's a widescreen, definitely a widescreen, but it's not um, super widescreen. It's like a typical is, HD. Yeah, typical size. HD, 16 by 9, whatever the exact aspect ratio is. I think it's 185 to 1, somewhere around there. Um, and I, ended up, I end up matting it off um, and going 2351 for the final product. So there's actual... There's actually more headroom, more top and bottom that actually get matted off for the final product. And they actually will actually go and reframe every single shot, just ever so slightly. Um, and I actually put, I actually mask off the the screen, the monitor, so that I can remember that there's going to be less. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. 
Yeah, so I will ask. So you you have a you actually look at it that way on the. the, Do you mask it off on your camera? Yeah, I just put pieces of tape on the top and bottom. Okay. Um, so so you're just exporting the native files when you do post production. You just export that out to to your editing program. Right. Yeah. So I'm I'm editing the they're they're unaltered. They're whatever the sixteen nine is. Um, I'm adding. I'm adding the mat in post. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the other, uh, you, you use a lot of camera movement. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of your favorite, um, call them toys for, you know, like the, the jib and the, the steady cam and the drones. Can you talk just a little bit about those and, and how you've worked with those? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think you just named my three favorites. Um, the <laughs> the crane is one of my favorites. I, I prefer the Jimmy Jibs. Um, and a lot of our live events, we bring out the Jimmy Jib to add that, you know, little extra bit of production value. Um, I actually, so that one shoot I did where we shot, um, we shot off the street and did the police chase actually shot with one of the, I don't know what they call them. Everybody has their own name of them, like the Gemini crane or whatever, where they actually rig like a Mercedes Benz. Um, with a gyro and jib on the top of the Mercedes Benz. So you can drive the car and then do jib shots on a moving car. That was like yeah, probably right. one of my most fun moments on set. Um, so, but that's not a toy we all get to. I, I wish I could pull that up to every one of my events and just sit in that car and shoot from there, but <laughs> not possible. <laughs> um, so there's the Jimmy jib. Uh, the drones have been amazing. Not, uh, Sorry. Do you have? Uh, are you working with an operator with stuff like this? I mean, is that something that you have to hire an operator when you rent that? Yeah, definitely. So always have okay. the, the owner operator as a dedicated operator. I'm not running back and forth. There's always somebody you know super experienced that he owns that jib and he knows exactly how to use it. Okay. The drones. Um, the drones have been amazing. Uh, you know, when I first started. Drones were super expensive, super difficult to fly. Um, you had to hire a crew. It was very expensive to pull off shots, um, very difficult to pull off shots, lots of vibration. Uh, nowadays, with the with what you know, DJI has done, it's just amazing. It's really easy to fly. Um, they're very cheap. The, you know, being able to fly a GoPro and having that GoPro footage look decent, um, it's been huge. So, um, But it, it's also another, you know, it's another another tool in the bag that we don't want to overuse. Uh, remember when like the sliders came out a couple years ago, those little camera sliders um, that mimic, mm-hmm. mimic dolly moves. Every video had like a million slider shots in it. Um, <laughs> and that, you know, that it, it's, it's, it's good to understand how your gear works. It's good to understand what the resulting look is, but then, you know, you want to justify it. Uh, you want it to be creatively motivated, dramatically motivated. You don't want to just, you know, have a million drone shots for the sake of having a million drone shots. Um, so I just try to ask myself, like, in a feature film, where would there be an aerial, you know, in this? Uh, I don't want to just shoot a bunch of aerials and just have them be gratuitous. Um, the same for the jib. Right. I would say um, my favorite... Um, my favorite way to track would be with a glide cam. Um, I've owned a steady cams. I've owned the steady cam flyer. Um, I played with the movie. The movie's awesome. Um, but I still prefer the glide cam and only for the fact that it's for me and my habits, it's fast. It's the fastest rig to use. Meaning I can throw the camera on. I can do, I can balance it. I can do my shot. I can pull the camera off and go to the next setup. Um, you know, it's got its limitations. It's not the best in terms of like what you can pull off. Um, Mm -hmm. but for me and the speed that I need and in how I work, it's, it's been the best in terms of allowing me to be fast. Do you typically try to keep a pretty, uh, small aperture for shooting with that? So you keep everything in focus? Yeah, I do. Um, I do. Uh, I, I, I would say, you know, I don't say like, oh, I need to keep it between this half stop and that half stop, but um, I probably would never go below, you know, a 2.8. I wouldn't I wouldn't go with a prime and shoot at 1.2 for a glide cam shot. Okay. Now with the, the drone, um, when you get the footage from the it's it's always the gopro right that's what you use yeah i've done i've done a couple shoots where um with the bigger drones with the 5d 
right. mostly GoPro. But the, okay. Is the footage from that as steady as what you are showing, or do you have to go through and post and do like a tracking so that it steadies out? It's pretty steady. Uh, it's pretty steady. I, you know, there's a lot of rolling shutter here and there, and obviously those are to me those are unusable. Um, those right. are unusable shots. Uh, it's, it's fairly steady. I think, you know, having to do like warp stabilizer and different things like that, um, that's great and it helps, but a lot of times it's noticeable. Um, you know, it's the way that it's, what it's doing to the shot to me is, yeah, it's steady, but then it's like, it's weird. Like it moves in a weird way in the corners and different things like that. Um, so I try to just right. get it right in camera. What, what rig are you using for that? I personally, we, we personally own, I own a Phantom 2 um, with the H3 3D, the Zenmuse, the DJI gimbal. Okay. So I guess the gimbal helps out a lot because I, I see so much footage. You know, I, I've been thinking about, you know, trying to get one of those myself. And every time I look at the footage, it's always like very shaky. So, I you know, when I watch your videos, I'm always amazed at how... You know, it looks like somebody's got a helicopter with a giant gimbal and everything. <laughs> and then, you know, to know it's just like a GoPro and a little, you know, somebody's just flying it with a remote control is kind of, you know, it's it's pretty amazing. Yeah, I I think um, I think what they've done is is, is pretty fascinating. I, and I did a lot of practice, um, just getting pricing from different crews and having done. I've done it all. Like I've done. Cineflex rigs on full-size helicopters all the way down to the old traditional like single rotor RC helicopters like way before the quadcopters um, so I've seen it right. all I've seen like all oh, how challenging it is and, and and you know how how much skill you need to pull these things off so I was very cautious like entering when I got my drone um, I got like a little toy from the electronic store and I just practiced in my backyard for like, like a long time. <laughs> and it, it, right. it is really like, I didn't want to like have a thousand dollar mistake. I wanted to have like a $50 mistake. Um, <laughs> you know, so just getting like muscle memory and how the controls work. Cause it's the same, you know, it's just the controls are the same. Um, then getting my phantom went down to like this massive open park we have here where there's like an actually, there's actually an RC field. Um, and just practicing in the middle of a massive open space. Um, where you're permitted to actually fly a drone uh, and just practice for like a good four or five days before my first actual, actual go, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's really tough. I, I, and I think that I see in the news a lot, people abusing, you know, the, what they have in their hands, which is, which is, uh, you know, it's a dangerous toy. Um, so for, <laughs> for filmmakers, you know, we're like, we're going to have some idiot who just crashed in the White House lawn with his drone. Um, and that's going to reflect on all the responsible ones of us who are not doing stupid things like that. Um, so, right. you know, I would just say practice makes perfect um, and understand that you have this very dangerous, like, you know, it's four blender blades spinning as fast as possible and that can hurt somebody. So just be, be careful, be responsible. Okay. Now moving into you know, walking down through uh, the process, moving into post-production. Can you talk about your process of um, editing and also grading and what kind of, you know, what what people need to learn in order to get the results that you have? If they're, if they're doing, I'm imagining it's that it's one person or a couple of people doing the whole process. Yeah, sure. Um, so post-production really... You know, it's been said that editing is the final phase of writing the script, and that's so true. Um, there's a t not a ton, but there's a lot of rewriting in the editing room, um, especially when you're dealing with lots of on-location guerrilla filmmaking with non-actors. Obviously, you know, there's a ton that's just going to be thrown at you that you never anticipated. You're going to get good and bad performances, so you have to be totally fluid in your ability to rewrite your script. Um, and I think that's probably one of the m most creative parts of the process. You know, writing is very easy because it's just you and your ideas and you're just putting them on paper. Um, editing, it's what you ha like you are, you only have this amount of footage and you have to tell the story with this footage that you have. Um, so for me, the process is how, wh what is the most efficient way I can tell the story? Like, I don't want anything on screen that doesn't need to be on screen. I'm, I'm trying to make the shortest film I can possibly make of the 
material I'm trying to convey. Um, so bring, get, making the scenes as short as they possibly can be um, is, is one one of my goals in editing um, and, and telling the mo telling the story the most effective way I possibly can. You know, if I have to restructure uh, the screenplay, I have to, if I have to do more of an experimental narrative, I will. Um, most of the time that's sort of pre-planned. Um, but it, it, it mo it's mostly like taking ideas out. I think in the writing process, it's easy to, you know, I have four ideas I'm trying to include here or four messages or four themes. And uh, when you get to the point where you're actually watching it on screen yourself as, as trying to pretend like you're in the audience, you realize it's probably too much. Um, I find that I'm, I'm actually distilling things down and simplifying things and, and taking it down from, you know, from four ideas, let's say in a scene to one idea or two ideas. Um, and, you know, that's just part of the creative process. And, and, you know, you get better at that. The more films you make, the more you, the more you direct and, and shoot, the better editor you will be. Do you storyboard or anything before you shoot? Sometimes, sometimes it depends. Um, I, I, I think when I first started, I storyboarded a lot more. Now I feel a little more comfortable, a little more confident in not storyboarding so much. Um, you know, storyboards can be limiting, especially when you're, you know, if you're shooting on location, it's not, if it's not a complicated sequence where there's a bunch of special effects, um, for me, it's easier to just show up, um, block the scene, watch the actors, like not even take the camera out of the bag, but just watch them go through the, the motions of the scene and, and watch, you know, just kind of walk around and, and do it that way, you know? Um, right. yeah, so I've, I've, I've sort of stopped storyboarding. I used to a lot more. <laughs> I used to a lot more. But do you have like a shot list? Yeah, definitely. Of course. Um, I'll have, yeah, I'll have my shot list. Oh, you know, obviously always starting wide, going in for the close-ups last. I always start with the professional actors. If I'm shooting one camera, I'll let them go through the scene first, expecting them to deliver a great performance in, in first take, letting the non-actors sort of use those moments as rehearsal time, um, and then eventually working my way to their close-up as the last thing we shoot in the day. Do you find the experienced actors are helping out the non-actors and like teaching them a little bit about how to act? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I think I think mo these films would probably fail if not for at least <laughs> at least the one or two or three or however many professional actors I can get in there. Um, right. You know, they help sell it obviously, and when when you have like a lot of acting is listening, right? So when you have somebody who's delivering an amazing emotional performance, it's easy to just react off of that and not pretend you're actually giving an authentic reaction. Now, um, at what point do you start working with music in the post-production process? And, and where do you find the, the music that you use? Uh, sometimes it's beforehand, just to uh, you know get an understanding of the tone and how the final product will turn out. Um, if I have, if there's an action sequence or something um, like a montage or something, I'll have to go and sort of like give you know get guide tracks or understand like how what the music ultimately will sound like. Um, I mean, I've done I've done everything from you know having composers create original scores to um, licensing music. I love. Uh, a couple sites I will mention, um, the music bed, the music um, and another one, song freedom, song freedom.com. And they really just been, they've come about recently. I and mean, like, if you asked me five years ago, I would say you're going to have to come up with a budget to license music directly from the music publisher. But now these amazing companies have come about where you can affordably license music and it actually sounds really good. To me, it sounds very cinematic. Um, you know, there's a bunch of composers um, on both of these sites that are extremely talented and they, they create, you know, three, four, five minute tracks. Um, and you can license them for a reasonable amount of money. Um, and, the, and this is where I get most of my music these days. Now, talking about licensing, is do you do things like getting releases and, and um, legal documents like you would in a film? Because it, it's like a personal, it's kind of a personal video, but at the same time, it's it's. Are you the owner of the video? How does it all work like that? Oh, for the short films, yeah. I mean, I'll do as much due diligence as possible. Um, I mean, I won't put like 
like for the airport scene, I'm not going to post a sign that says like you're in a movie right now. Um, <laughs> you know, but from in terms of the cast, yeah, obviously we get the model releases. Um, we do SAG agreements if we're shooting here in the U.S. Um, um, you know, in terms of you know, like the one of the bigger budget things we did in terms of like shutting down streets and doing that whole thing, always, always getting permission, always pulling permits, um, always doing due diligence, making sure that we're doing everything properly. Um, copyright wise, um, it's usually our copyright. Um, for like the live event stuff, we'll still retain the copyright on the final products, like whatever, whatever final videos is created from from their event is our artistic interpretation and it's our copyright um so yeah i mean there's not really too much legal to do on a live event um it's a live event we're documenting it and you know that's that there's nothing really more to do right okay now i have two more final sections um they're my new uh podcast sections that i'm going to start doing with everyone um, the uh, the first question is, what is your favorite book about filmmaking or learning resource that people could check out? Ooh, that's a great question. <laughs> that is a great question. And I don't know if I can just give you one book. <laughs> well, okay. um, I'll try. I'll try. Let me think. Let me think. Let me think. Feel free to name more if you want. Well, I'll say the one that stands out for me um, was one that my – one of my professors wrote and it's called, and it, it sucks that I'm saying this cause it's going to be really hard to find. Um, but it's called screenwriting from the soul. Um, and it was written by Richard Krevlin. He's my screenwriting professor from film school. Um, and I don't know that it's easy to find that book. Um, so I'll name another one. Um, and that's going to be, that's, I'm going to, I'm going to say the power of myth. That's the Joseph Campbell book. And that will be very easy to find. Um, and Joseph Campbell talked all about storytelling and that always, his, his, um, his stuff really stuck with me. Okay. Now the next section is the time machine. If you could go back in time and find yourself when you were maybe, you know, 18, 19, 20, what advice would you have to you to give to yourself as somebody who wanted to work in the film industry? Oh, wow. That's a great question as well. <laughs> Thanks. These are, okay, wow. Let me think about that. What would I tell myself? Uh, I'd probably tell myself, stop screwing around. Um, don't, be too, <laughs> don't be too distracted with too many extracurricular activities and focus. I think that's probably what everybody would tell their 18-year-old self. Um, I, I, would, I would say, you know, you know, just keep, don't, don't ask for permission don't get permission to do your work, do your art, do your craft. Just do it. You know, don't ask, you know, don't look for somebody to give you the green light and say, here's money, go make your movie. Just do it. Find a way to do it yourself. Um, that's the only way you're going to get better. And expecting to be given permission is an unrealistic expectation because there's so many people wanting to do this thing. It's, you know, just go do it. Well, great. That, that's about all the questions. Is there anything that you have coming up? Any workshops or anything that you are, you know, promoting or want to plug? <laughs> well, I am speaking at um, a conference coming up in a few weeks. It's called WPPI. It's a wedding and portrait, wedding portrait photographers international. So they just added a filmmaking track last year. Um, so it's for event, live event and wedding videographers and photographers who want to, you know, understand more cinematic way, more ways to create cinematic films. Um, and I'm speaking at that and I think it's WPP, it's probably WPPI.com if you want to learn more about that. Okay. Well, Kevin, I really appreciate your time, man. And I've definitely learned a lot of stuff. Thanks for, for joining us here. And, and I really appreciate it. All right, Jason. Thank you for having me. All right. I want to thank our guest, Kevin Shahinian, for coming on. One thing I did after our interview was I emailed Kevin and I asked him if he could give me a list of some of the gear that he used. So if you go to the podcast page on the IndieFilmAcademy.com, you will see all the gear that he uses for audio and some of the other things uh, that we discussed in the podcast, like the drones and some of the 
model numbers. So if you're interested in buying that or just learning more about it, you can go to IndieFilmAcademy.com and there's links and everything. So that's it for today, guys. Thanks a lot for joining us. We're going to try to put out a podcast every Tuesday. If you have any suggestions, anybody that you think might be a good guest or a topic that you want us to cover, feel free to send me a message on Twitter or an email or Facebook and just let us know what you want to hear or what we can do to make your life easier as a filmmaker. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back next Tuesday with a new episode. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Academy podcast. Don't forget to join our newsletter for more tips and tricks on how to make and market your film online. Go to www.indiefilmacademy.com.